Hello, this video teaches a general approach to examination of the back and is tailored around a scenario where a patient presents with inflammatory back pain. In cases of acute back pain or chronic mechanical back pain, however, the examination is differently focused and usually much more limited. A good history is therefore necessary to direct your physical examination. For teaching purposes, I have structured the exam into inspection, palpation, range of movement, and special tests. I will first demonstrate some surface anatomy and finish off the exam with a quick neurological screen of the lower limbs. It is useful to note some basic anatomy. The spine has four balanced curves, the cervical lordosis, the thoracic kyphosis, the lumbar lordosis, and the sacral coccygeal kyphosis. The thoracic kyphosis can be exaggerated in patients with chronic inflammatory conditions of the spine, such as ankylosing spondylitis, and can also be seen in patients with vertebral fractures, as you can find with patients with osteoporosis. The lumbar lordosis can be exaggerated in patients with a contracture of the hip, as I explained in the hip video, and it can be lost or flattened out and be quite straight in patients who have chronic arthritis of the spine, such as ankylosing spondylitis. We will now look at some of the bony prominences. The bony prominence at the base of the neck represents the spinous process of C7. The spine of the scapula correlates with the spinous process of T3, and the inferior angle of the scapula corresponds with the spinous process of T7. If you were to draw a line across from both iliac crests, this will cross the midline at the L3, L4 space. This is often used as a landmark in doing a lumbar puncture. Inferior to this, you'll see the dimples of Venus. These correspond to the posterior superior iliac spine. Inferior medial to these dimples are the sacral iliac joints on either side. When asked to examine the back or any part of the lower limb, always take note of the patient's gait. Look at the mechanics for symmetry and smoothness of movement. Look at the swing phase and stride length. Also, take note of the stance phase, from heel strike to mid stance to toe off. If pain is coming from a particular leg, the patient will shorten the time spent on that leg and the stance phase is therefore shorter. Also note the patient's ability to turn quickly and smoothly. You should also look at how the patient transitions from sitting to standing as this can give you useful information about the source of back pain. Observe the patient from the front, the side and the back. Take note of the patient's posture and the normal curvatures of the spine, the cervical lordosis, thoracic kyphosis, lumbar lordosis and sacral coccygeal kyphosis. Look at the alignment of the spine for scoliosis and the height of the shoulders. With significant scoliosis, the shoulder would be higher on the convex side of the scoliosis. This can be brought out by the Adams forward bend test. The scapula would be higher on the convex side of the scoliosis. Look at the skin for any discoloration, erythema, scars, swelling or masses. Also take note of any muscle atrophy or asymmetry. Look at the supraspinatus, the trapezius muscle and the paraspinal muscles. Also, you should check and record the patient's height. Palpation is best done with the patient sitting or lying prone so that you can apply firm pressure. If you do it standing, support the patient so that you don't push them over. Start at the occiput and work your way down. You will not feel C1 as it does not have a spinous process. Feel the spinous processes for tenderness as well as the interspinous ligaments between these processes. If the ligaments are tender, this suggests enthesitis. Do this all the way down to the sacral spine. Palpate the muscles as well for bulk and tenderness, the supraspinatus, the trapezius muscle, and the paraspinal muscles on both sides. You can find tenseness and tenderness of the muscles with myofascial pain. We will begin with cervical range of movement. Assess flexion by having the patient touch the chin to the chest. 
The patient should be able to do this and the distance should be zero. Then assess extension. Normally the chin should reach or pass the horizontal level of the ear. Then ask the patient to put the ear to the shoulder for lateral flexion. Do this on both sides. This is often the first range of movement to be affected with cervical spine problems. Next, look at rotation. Normal is more than 70 degrees to each side. An estimation is usually adequate, but if you want to measure and follow rotation over time, you will need a goniometer. When using a goniometer, ensure that the middle of it is over the axis of rotation. Anchor one arm of the goniometer against your body. If you are not tall enough to see over the patient's head and onto their nose, you can stand on a stool. Align the anterior arm of the goniometer with the patient's nose. Then have the patient turn as much as possible to one side. Align the arm with the patient's nose and record the measurement. Then do this to the other side. And again, record that measurement. We will now assess thoracolumbar range of movement. Assess flexion by having the patient bend forward and try to touch the toes while keeping the knees straight. You can measure the finger to floor distance. This, however, is of limited value as it can be affected by abdominal obesity, problems with the hip joint, tight hamstrings, and the general level of fitness of the patient. What may be more useful is to observe the rhythm of movement of the spine. The lumbar lordosis should transition to a lumbar kyphosis as the patient bends forward. This may not be seen with arthritis of the spine. To assess thoracolumbar extension, have the patient lean against the firm support so that they don't fall over while bending backwards, and they are less inclined to bend the knees. We'll then assess lateral flexion. To do this, have the patient stand against the wall. In this way, the patient will be less inclined to flex or extend the spine while bending sideways. As a gross screen, you can check the finger fibular distance. Have the patient slide the hand down the thigh to the fibular head. The patient should be able to touch the fibular head, so the finger fibular distance should be zero. If you wish to follow lateral flexion over time, it is best to use a tape and measure. For demonstration purposes, I will have Brendan step away from the wall. Have the patient stand erect with the arms at both sides. Make a mark at the fingertip. And then have the patient slide the hand down one side as far as possible without leaning forward or bending backwards and make a second mark. Then measure the distance between these two marks. Normal is more than 10 centimeters, and you can follow this measurement over time. The other way to do this is to measure from the finger to the floor. So I will first measure in neutral. And then I will have Brendan slide his hand down as far as possible. And I will measure again. Record the difference between these two measurements. Assess thoracolumbar rotation by having the patient sit on the bed so that the pelvis is planted. Have the patient cross the arms over the chest and then turn to one side as much as possible and then to the other. You can also stress the spine passively while observing the patient for pain. The first few special tests I will do can actually be done during the range of movement assessment. We will first look at occiput to wall distance. Have the patient stand with the heels and back against the wall. Normally the occiput should touch the wall so the distance will be zero. However, this will be increased with cervical or thoracic kyphosis and should be measured. Make sure that the tragus and tip of the nose are in the same horizontal plane. This is to prevent, for example, a patient with exaggerated thoracic kyphosis from hyperextending the neck to touch the wall and giving a falsely normal occiput to wall distance. We will now assess chest expansion. 
To do this, you can place your hands around the patient's chest. Have the patient breathe out all the way and then take the deepest breath possible. Your thumb should move apart by more than 4 centimeters. To more accurately measure this, you can use a tape measure. Traditionally, you will be told to put the tape at the level of the fourth intercostal space, which is around the nipple line. However, you can appreciate the difficulty doing this in women and in overweight men. It is best to put the tape at the level of the xiphoid process or xiphy sternum. I will have Brendan pass me the tape around his chest. In this way, I don't have to reach around the patient to get the tape. Then make sure that the tape is at a level that you want. Okay. Can you breathe out all the way, Brandon? Okay, take the deepest breath possible. Okay. Measure the difference. A difference of more than four centimeters is normal. Less than 2.5 centimeters is definitely abnormal. The next measurement is the modified Schober's test. This reflects lumbosacral flexion. To do this, make a mark in the midline between the dimples of Venus. Then measure 10 centimeters above that mark. And five centimeters below. Then have the patient bend forward to try to touch the toes while keeping the knees straight. Measure the distance between the uppermost and lowermost marks. This should have increased by more than five centimeters. You can repeat the test a couple of times and take the best measurement. With the patient on the bed, one of the first tests you should do is the straight leg raise. This is a test for irritation of the roots of the sciatic nerve, L4, L5, S1, and S2. Cup your hand under the heel and with the knee straight, elevate the leg. A positive test is pain radiating down the back of the leg and into the foot. This usually happens between 30 and 70 degrees. If you get a positive test, slowly release the leg until the pain stops. Then you can dorsiflex the ankle and the pain may return. This is called a positive Lasag sign. A normal straight leg raise can help rule out sciatic nerve irritation but is not specific. A more specific test is the cross straight leg raise test. With this, elevation of the asymptomatic leg causes pain to radiate down the symptomatic leg. This is 90% specific for sciatica, but would only happen in about 25% of patients. There are a few tests to stress the sacroiliac joints. These include the Fabus test and the Gainsons test. I will first demonstrate the Faber's test. Faber stands for flexion, abduction, and external rotation. You can simply ask the patient to put the heel on the opposite knee. This is also known as a figure of four test. Have the patient relax the leg so that the knee falls into the bed. Then stabilize the opposite hemipelvis and press down on the knee while observing the patient for pain. A positive test is pain in the lower back or buttock. Very often, the patient may have discomfort on the anterior aspect of the thigh. This is not a positive Faber's test. The next test is the Gainsland's test. The principle of this test is to try to create movement within the sacroiliac joints at the back. To do this test, have the patient come to the edge of the bed and hang one leg off the bed, making sure that the thigh is off. You can use your body to support the patient so that he doesn't fall off the bed. Then have the patient bring one leg to the chest. By doing this, the left hemipelvis is anchored while the right hemipelvis is allowed to rotate a bit as the leg comes off the bed. A positive test will be pain in the lower back or buttock. Finally, I will demonstrate the femoral nerve stretch. You should do this if the patient is complaining of pain radiating down the anterior aspect of the thigh. To do this test, flex the knee and while stabilizing the patient's back, raise the leg off the bed. A positive test will be reproduction of the patient's anterior thigh pain. Finally, I will finish off with a quick neurological screen. 
My demonstration is not meant to represent a thorough neurological examination. You may be required to do a neuroscreen depending on the clinical scenario. I would first assess the tone of the leg and the ankle and foot and check for clonus. Then I will assess power. Don't let me push your leg down. This represents hip flexion. Don't let me push your leg up. This is hip extension. Don't let me push your knee in. This is knee extension. Don't let me pull your leg out. This is knee flexion. Don't let me push your foot down. This is ankle dorsiflexion. Don't let me push your foot up. This is ankle plantar flexion. Don't let me push your great toe down. This is great toe dorsiflexion. Next, assess the deep tendon reflexes and remember to compare both sides for each part of the neurological examination. We'll first assess the patellar tendon reflex. To do this, you can have the patient sitting or you can support the knee. Locate the infrapatellar tendon. This represents L2 to L4, but mainly L4. Then assess the Achilles tendon reflex. To do this, externally rotate the leg and dorsiflex the foot, then tap on the Achilles tendon. You will notice contraction of the calf muscle and plantar flexion of the foot. We will then assess the plantar response. To do this, apply firm pressure along the lateral border of the sole of the foot and move medially. You would notice that the toes flex. This is a normal response. Upgoing toes is a positive Bobinski sign and indicates an upper motor neuron lesion. Finally, you can finish off by checking sensation in the major dermatomes. You can do this by having the patient close their eyes and say yes when they feel you touch them. L1 is in the area of the groin. L2 is just below that on the anterior aspect of the thigh. L3 extends across to the medial aspect of the knee. L4 is on the lateral aspect of the knee, extending over the shin and to the medial border of the foot. L5 is on the dorsum of the foot, and S1 is on the lateral border of the foot. And remember to compare both sides. I hope this video was useful to you. Other videos, as well as the corresponding clinical skills manual, including evidence-based physical exam statistics, can be found on roomtutor.com. Thank you.